atmosphere. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I think I can personally perform better in this kind of cold atmosphere. And really, really first of all, I have to thanks for having Stakeson and me, Chris, here for having this, doing this sharing about Stakeson. And today, the topic for sharing is a standard of option liquidity as the new module in the era of modularity because one really wants to make a combination for risk taking modularity as the major thesis for today's sharing session. So uh, currently in this market, what, what's, what kind of voice we hear? Like modularity is the future and we are very, very hyped about risk taking. So there are trends. and. Like before we starting on lots of details, we like to say like Stakesome as the omnichannel liquidity distribution infrastructure, like sitting in the intersection or a crossing field for modularity as well as race staking. So it's very excited we got the opportunity to share some of our observation and thoughts in terms of like all the opportunities we got uh, with the builders and protocols and project with all these directions. So first let's start with modularity. Uh, as mentioned, Stakesone's business is connect the supply side as well as demand side of liquidity. And we highly focus on growing with the rising ecosystems. Uh, that's how we are basically achieve 1 billion liquidity uh, in TVL. So what interesting we observe from like the chains and ecosystems we're talking with, partnering with, and future going to work with is uh, the inevitable trend for modularity. Uh, we, can, we, get, we can give some examples here because they're all trying to seize advantages uh, in terms of embracing modularity. So first of all, then Mana Network, we work together very closely and achieve 800 million liquidity. <laughs> Don't have to say much about it because it's a very, very outstanding modular blockchain. And I personally heavily integrated and interacted with Manta before the they switch to Celestia, and like uh, as a DeFi user, I have to say the experience is going to be totally different to levels. And B squared, they currently secure it's Polygon CDK, and currently secured around 400 million liquidity. And interestingly, they are also developing their own data ability layer. And for Ostar, they originated in Polkadot, and now what's modularity. And for Tusami, very interesting things. They have lots of resources in terms of the offline retail systems. Uh, sorry, not offline, off-chain retail systems in Japan. But their, fun, uh, their, their funding teams told us they're quite excited about like the near DA as well as Polygon CDK and willing to adopt uh, this as a tech solutions for the resource that they got. And also recently we got mod OP stack and also a modular DeFi layer too. So basically what can say that uh, they all have very, very different like origins, but what's the same trend? That is they're all embracing modularity to a certain degree. So this is basically our observation we made for our partners as well as our customers for liquidity. And I have to say that for Sixon, as we're dealing with liquidity, what we observe is that we mentioned lots of chains, lots of ecosystems, and we find out every chain has their different advantages. They have different features. Someone, I have, they have different strengths. Someone's focused on community, have very strong community, a very strong vibe. Someone is building, basically I have like advanced technologies in terms of the technical infrastructure. Someone said I'm focused on GameFi, someone said I'm focused on SocialFi, someone said I'm focused on, DeFi, focused on DeFi. So chains actually find out they're trying to make themselves different in terms of getting advantages. But, from our perspective, as well as the real need for all these chains builders and teams, they have the same need and pain points for cost effect liquidity for its, its application layers. So they need liquidity to build their ecosystem, not only DeFi, but also other, uh, as we mentioned, SocialFi, GameFi, they can also, or, or on chain gaming, they can also adopt the bearing assets to increase their capital efficiency. And this is basically where stakes on sitting and the opportunity we got is we find out that there's an opportunity to be an omnichannel liquidity infrastructure, a solution for all these rising chains with different features, but with the same need for liquidity. So here, like, uh, basically wants to echo with today's um, major topic of this modularity is that we find out there's an opportunity to be, uh, we call it liquidity as a service or um, liquidity infrastructure like Stakestone itself can be a new module for chains on its application layer. That's beyond basically, it's not, not only data ability or consensus layer, it's happening on its applications layer. So by adopting it, 
they solve the pain points uh, as basically their liquidity. And then by adopting the module on their application layers, they can further gain advantages. And I would like to further dive into uh, solutions for Sexon and to further echo back how the solutions can solve these problems. So on the left side, it's kind of high, basically this is the illustration and high-level well abstraction for Sexon protocols. When users deposit Ethereum mainnets, they will get Stone. And Stone is a yield-bearing assets or omnichain yield-bearing Ethereum that can tap into different kinds of underlying assets. Currently, we do Ethereum staking, and we're also like uh, definitely 100% compatible, compatible with Ray staking. And uh, elaborate more on Ray staking parts. Basically, we're compatible with LSD Ray staking, Bitcoin Ray staking, as well as Ray staking pools, or you can call it LRTs. Um, and all these underlying assets are managed under a decentralized fund management system. So basically, users deposit Ethereum, and they get a stone, which is the omnichain yield bearing Ethereum. Another size for the bridging part. Um, this is something that happening around the Ethereum CC in Paris. At that time, we realized the supply side, uh, basically demand side of liquidity are switching from the Ethereum mainnet to the rising ecosystems and not on the mainnet anymore. Instead, it's not sep basically in the past, in the DeFi summers or even even before a few months ago, that is separated protocols that uh, I want liquidity to build myself that is seated on the mainnet. But now we see this that we have rising ecosystems and chains with all the protocols within them that is seeking liquidity <coughs> as a whole. So we adopt layer zero's OFT standard as the very beginning. And uh, this helps Stone to get a very strong cross-chain compatibility. So basically, user deposit Ethereum, get stolen, and bridge them to all these ecosystems, uh, and further apply them on the application layer in different protocols. Well, this is just a very high level abstraction, and probably can get a chance to share more about it in the future. So here comes the question is why adopting it? So basically, it also integrates some of the uh, some of the thesis or some of the trends we observe in this market, and also this is echo back to the visions and position of six on itself. Uh, first of all, adopting the six stone as well as stone in this application layer, the new module, helps the change to solve the opportunity cost for Ethereum because um, basically this trend happened after the merge, and it's intensified after Shanghai upgrade, and basically currently, uh, like, and uh, I think all is become a consensus for the chains builders after the huge success for Blast as well as Manda. So yield bearing is important for layer two because native Ethereum is too expensive to be attracted at this moment, especially in the bull market as well as our huge expectations for raise staking. So the opportunity cost for Ethereum is insane and there is going to be one asset that helps the chains to wrap the risk free rewards, basically staking, raise staking and also upcoming potential uh, risk for yield sources. So Stone helped them to solve the problem for native yields, as well as solve the problem for opportunities called for Ethereum. And second is like one standard with less fraction, because at the very beginning we mentioned that Stone wants to be the standard for omnichain liquidity, wants to be a standard for yield bearing Ethereum. And why one, st one standard is so important? Uh, I want to address, like per personally I want to say like when I come to America, uh, I I have to use US dollar, I have to change money, right? And also, I cannot use Union Pay's card here. And also, my only Visa card don't have a chip, so I cannot use as a payment in most of the use cases. So basically, we can, if we draw this structure on chain, it's basically like, we are, why we not speak the same language in all the regions? Why if I want to explore different ecosystems with my, for example, with my uh, fixed amount Ethereum, why I have to switch back switch back and forth into a different asset standard, asset type, and as lots of frictions and fragmentations of liquidity during the swap stake, on stake, withdrawal, things like that. So we basically think that it's very, very important to have one standard for liquidity that is to reduce, uh, the purpose of it is to reduce the fragmentations, and it's going to be the first principle. One, one standard for high efficiency and uh, yield bearing for higher capital efficiency, uh, for, for, for higher capital efficiency and more cost effective liquidity. And the third thing is very interesting is the chain itself from chain's perspective, it seems that they adopt a normal ERC20 token. So there's nothing special. But actually, uh, the chain itself got empowered from the whole industry chain in terms of the yield generation as well as liquidity providers. 
So this layer are chains, and basically here is referring to their application layers. And this is where Stackstone and Stone sits in. So first of all, we connect liquidity providers, spent a long time with them to build trust with individuals, with communities, with institutions. So here is liquidity providers put Ethereum into Stackstone, the liquidity infrastructure, then they get stone. So oh, save the application layer, spend enough time on them. So for a younger generation part, they get so a liquidity provider gets stone layer bearing Ethereum for um, for the center of on-chain um, liquidity, and they further apply them into different use cases to get another layer of rewards to max them the capital efficiency. And on the other hand, for the Ethereum, they enter the what we call the part of yield generation, taping to staking, as well as raise staking. So for staking, also it can be done with staking pools, and also. Um, basically, there are lots of players here, but currently we only do with staking pools, but definitely 100% compatible with it. And also do with weather providers. The so race staking part is the same. We can do it with staking pools, you can do the big engine race staking, you can do the LSD race staking, and finally the funds go to the AVS operators like Outlayer. So basically, by adopting Stone, it's not just about adopting a normal ERC20 token, it's about adopting the power of the whole industry chain, including liquidity provision as well as the geo generation. All right, I spent lots of time on the application layer, application of stone, or basically it's a use case of stone. And currently go back to the basically second topics for stakes on this, restaking as well as echo back to the major theme of today's sharing. That is like, uh, what is the potentials for stakes only in terms of race staking? Uh, basically, there are a few points. First of all, as mentioned, that stake stone and the stone's mission is to brought risk-free rewards to the rising chains and ecosystems, as well as existing one, definitely. And to increase the capital efficiency for users' chains and protocols on the application layer. So we see great potentials in terms of race staking at the very, very beginning. So we make sure our architecture is compatible with it, even before I think I can layer it enable the first deposit to make sure the, the overall architecture is compatible with it. So adopting the restaking into the underlying assets for Stakestone is one of the strategies and the allocated Ethereum we collected into it can re increase the risk-free reward uh, for Ethereum and going to hence benefit everyone adopting Stone. Uh, and second is, <laughs> sorry, I think I just covered the second part. Uh, Stone has, uh, Stakestone has uh, multiple underlying uh, management system that can tap into different kinds of yield sources and manage fully on chain as well as decentralized. Um, so basically, this is uh, some of the synergies for Stone with Eigenlayer as well as Race Taken. Uh, currently, uh, we I think in, in the mid of March or the beginning of March, we're going to make the first deposit around uh, make going to make the first deposit into the Race Taken ecosystems. Uh, here, I also like to draw. This is uh, one of the scenarios I, uh, I would like to uh, I would like to draw from a very very high level. Is that uh, for Eigenlayer is building the liquidity market for the consensus layer. They get their own liquidity and get them restaked uh, into different cases, but, on, but basically on the consensus layer. But for Stakestone, we gather liquidity, put them into race staking to enhance, it, enhance the capital efficiency. And also for Stone itself, the token itself can be further distributed into use cases on the applications layers. So uh, basically, on this perspective, Stone itself and Stakestone as an overall system is the liquidity market or option liquidity market for the application layer. And also we have a VE model to make sure it happens and make, make sure it makes sense on the economic perspective and also help the protocols to capture the value. All right, so the final thing is I, I grabbed lots of information in this page and also this is something that's currently we are thinking about because we're really serious in terms of providing risk taking service in the future. And also this might be kind of open questions for like all audiences and like lovers for stakers here. Uh, the first is like um, the number as well as the diversity for AVSs because like in your communications with the one who are interested in building AVSs as well as all layers, they're, they're helping with lots of this AVSs upcoming. Uh, thinking about, there, first of all, there's lots of, the, the fundamental differences is that uh, staking and restaking uh, in this part is for staking the underlying assets uh, is homogeneous. Like basically you put Ethereum into Bitcoin chain, you put Ethereum into validators. So there's no huge differences 
among all different kinds of service providers. But for AVS, it's going to be very, very different. Um, so if we draw synergy, uh, if we say like ETH staking is the on-chain treasure bill, we would say AVSs are more like corporate bonds or corporate bills with different level of risk as well as different level of rewards. So it's going to be a really, really diverse as well as complex ecosystems. And here we might have the kind of concept called like blue chip AVSs probably because if you have 30, 40, 70, 100 AVSs, some of them are going to be more stable and less slashed while uh, offering you with probably more balance and or even less rewards. And some of them, they are very aggressive, constantly slashed, but it might offer you more aggressive rewards. So very excited to see the future and basically the uh, the, the birth of the concept for a blue chip DeFi, uh, blue chip AVS, AVSs like we see in the past, like blue chip DeFi, like we see cheat out here, right? Uh, as well as like, um, yeah, it's very, it's very interesting and looking forward to the real AVSs ecosystem in the future. Uh, and second is, we're thinking about the capital capacity for each separate AVSs as well as the race staking ecosystem as a whole. So currently we have huge amount of liquidity um, in Aguilar and also lots of liquidity are still waiting to be restaked. But here comes the problem is like, as the AVSs, how many liquidity uh, I will be accepted to restake into my consensus layer as well as I have to distribute a fair rewards for them. Um, so basically this is going to be a uh, we can do some. We have to do some calculations, as well as anticipations for it. For for separate AVSs, how much can I accept for a staking system? How much I can accept? If I have lots of AVSs, and it's going to be uh, lots of challenges for our like uh, basically uh, 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 AVSs operator providers uh, like outlayers, and also I think lots of traditional valid providers also swift uh, expand their business into this area. Uh, lots of challenges for them, but that we're also very excited about dynamics because based on the different portfolios, based on the different AVSs, you might have a combination of different AVSs and finally get, deliver different performances as well as in terms of their risk as well as their rewards. So it's going to be my, more interesting, more diverse than it's staking probably at this moment. And finally is uh, some thoughts and perspective from Stakestone is that as, as constantly mentioned in the, in the beginning, uh, Stakestone has the com uh, has ability to be compatible with different kind of assets, and our basically goal is to uh, make Stone itself uh, delivering the secure as well as stable rewards for the chain's ecosystem as well as users. So basically, we think that uh, by compatible with different NLRN assets, instead of fixing it or uh, instead of like influencing the stone we already issued, uh, we got the ability to reach a better balance in terms of risk as well as rewards for the upcoming very, very diverse like restaking AVS ecosystems. Uh, so basically, this is the, oh, sorry, this is everything I'd like to share today. And really, really thanks for having us, uh, having stakes on here. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so I think we've seen in blast that actually like the two possibilities for a, a yield burning asset either rebases or increases the value constantly. And both these are bad, especially for, for stable point of assets because it requires cost of power charge and it makes these assets incompatible with their kind of DeFi uh, like uh, protocols. I guess if you thought about introducing like a way to uh, to segregate the yield for a stake stone for, for roll-up based assets, kind of like what Blast is doing for a bridge or uh, uh, I grabbed two points in the questions. Correct me if I'm wrong. First of all, like rebase tokens really not that friendly for DeFi compatibilities. So uh, as day one stone is a rebalancing token, it's not rebase. So basically every DeFi protocols can integrate it without additional complexity. And second is how to solve the problem for bearing native yields for, uh, for layer two. As in that case, I propose the line that we're building the first, yield, uh, first live yield bearing layer two because by then uh, blast don't have a mainnet. Sorry for that, but how we achieve that is uh, we write around, we exactly have 99 lines of code and we post it on Twitter. And when users deposit Ethereum on mainnet, uh, this one transaction will activate staking as well as bridging in this one transaction. So the user experience is going to be like this. I deposit Ethereum on Ethereum mainnet. 
and I directly receive LSD or yield bearing theorem net storm on my antenna network. So in the past case, we do things like that, but we have a bunch of solutions for that. Um, so when Blast came out, the market isn't quite ready for that, but at this moment, we have lots of like other choices. We have layer zeros, as mentioned, we already successfully made it in different cases. And also we have intent-based particles. Um, they are, we have to, we have conversation with several of them, and they have the solutions for six. So, but, uh, okay, yeah. so the third thing is you can also have a kind of a uh, liquidity pool model for basically bridging the assets. The user experience comes to like, I deposit Ethereum and I get, uh, uh, basically I deposit Ethereum on the chain, on the, on the, on the, on the source chain and I get LSD on the target chain. Uh, this experience is going to be like bridge, but in fact is conducted by swapping in terms of liquidity pool. So we have lots of solutions for that and I think today is not going to be a huge, huge problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It's just, it, it seems like the, the fragmentation, well, it's like the outline, but I've been thinking about this one, but like there's a lot of fragmentation just by having a separate yield bearing asset that's not. Yeah, exactly. This is something I like to say. So basically we see like exchanges, uh, they want to have their own yield bearing assets. Um, this is understandable. But if we have 10, 20, 30, yield bearing assets in this market, and they are based on, like for example, we're doing for race taking, based on different kinds of underlying assets, are going to be too much fragmented for users for participating in different kind of, for different ecosystems. Uh, if I'm a very on-chain active, uh, very active on-chain players, I will not sit my funds in one ecosystem, in one use cases. Instead, I have to move it frequently. But frictions and fragmentation happens when I have to switch the centers, uh, as well as, uh, if I, have, if I have to switch the chain, I have to switch the sender, then the fragmentation is going to be basically very huge. And this is, comes to the first principle, why we need one standard for the omnichain liquidity. Okay. Thanks for sharing. And I also noticed the uh, only feature of the Storm token. Uh, it's quite interesting. So I have one very simple question. Yeah. Is the Storm on different chains will be traded equally? Or they will be uh, different. Maybe they have different price, uh, different uh, different uh, redeem, uh, uh, redeem time, or uh, maybe you will charge different fees for maybe stake or on the stock process. I got it. So basically, I think there are two perspectives in terms of respond. The first is I can explain the mechanism in terms of bridging. So currently, no matter you're using Axler, using Layer Zero, or using 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 CIP, using uh, basically using Wormhole or any of it, it's the bridging itself is like you you lock the assets on the source chain as well as the to the another kind of you to the assets on the target chain. So basically this is a mechanism as well as this mechanism for uh, for stakes on itself. So for stone is going to be treated definitely going to the assets is going to be treated equally on every chain because the assets is locked. For example, I want to bridge stone to a chain that's supported by layer zero. So stone is locked on Ethereum and uh, because we do some uh, customization in terms of the bridging services. So for, for OFT, native OFT, it's, I think it's going to be a burn and mint, but burn and mint will influence Stone's price. So it's, we, are, we are doing a lock and mint. So you lock Stone on the source chain and you issue another Stone on the target chain. So basically the standard of the assets really depends on who issued the token or which standard you follow. So basically if you follow the real standards uh, when on the chain support, it's going to be, basic, technically speaking, it's going to be the same. And when we, and about the redemption and the price part. And for the redemption, the redemption only happens on the mainnet because all the real assets like Ethereum or ST Ethereum or the Bitcoin chain Ethereum that's in the validator are all on the Ethereum mainnet. So if they want to do the redemption, they have to bridge Ethereum, uh, bridge their stone back to mainnet and do the withdrawal. And about the price, the price definitely going to be a little bit different across different chains because you here you are referring to a DEX price. And DEX price really depends on users trading experience, trading behaviors, as well as the depth of liquidity on each specific chain. And there may, might be a chance for arbitrage, but if the space is not enough, there's going to be a slight difference for Stone's price on different chains. Mm -hmm. May I ask you one question? Yeah, please, please, please. So we noticed the price on the mental of Stone. 
Yeah, because the bridge is because uh, I totally understand. This is what very this is to uh, so frequently ask because uh, according to Manta's policy, they will not open the bridge. So the, the, yeah, stone cannot be withdrawn. If they can get some uh, stone, they can withdraw to the east anytime. Yeah, basically what is going on here is like arbitrager cannot finish the arbitrage. Yeah. Even though we, we know someone in person, they bought a huge amount of stone, but they cannot bridge them back into mainnet and get Ethereum to finish the arbitrage. So since the arbitrage itself is not completed, uh, the DPAC happens. As, uh, yes, this is the question that we're uh, frequently referring to. Um, uh, in fact, you have a huge amount of liquidity required on Manta to constantly repack the price because the Manta's reward is happening previously, not at the end. So users all have the organic uh, like organic incentives and motivations to bridge the assets out of Manta to uh, increase uh, to dramatically increase their capital efficiency. So I think uh, around two days ago, someone bought the large amount of stone, yeah. even repacked the price, and it is immediately depacked. So it's going to be a loop forever like this uh, because the arbitrage cannot be completed on the mainnet. Yes. Okay, thank you for the question. It's a good one. If no more questions, may I ask another one? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. So like after all these like airdrops happen, right? Like maybe Hydro Layer does an airdrop for you. So maybe you guys do like how do you see people staying on Eigen, like keeping their ETH here and there? Because they have a pretty high like uh, opportunity cost, right? Uh, and at the same time the risk is very high given like this slashing. So how how do you see like do you think people like DBSs are gonna have enough money to pay people to Outweigh that cost after the airdrop? Oh yes, this is a pretty harsh one though. Because <laughs> it's, it's like very like like the risks are very high, right? You get slashed, but mm. now like everybody's like farming the airdrop. But what happens after? Um, because we are not icon layer, but from a Stixon's perspective, so sticky, right? Uh, currently we do zero percent with risk staking because we really want to be very very cautious with that because we know some part of it isn't finished yet and the egg pause need an upgrade so we move pretty pretty slow in that pace but uh, in a general sense we bullish about the potential in terms of boosting the risk for rewards and I, I didn't I, 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 I'm not sure whether you still remember I mentioned the concept of blue chip AVS that is like uh, when, for example, Eigen DA, they deliver their rewards in terms of Ethereum. And it probably is going to be one of the first very, very stable and give you a very fair rewards AVSs and going to be solid uh, boosted for the risk reward Ethereum. And then we call it blue chip AVSs. And another thing is for stakes on internal assets, our underlying assets is not fixed. And uh, we think this is our advantage. So when, like, the, basically it dep depends on the future growth of AVS ecosystem, as we mentioned, the diversity the number, the capital capacity, it's all unfixed at this moment. But the, we got flexibility. If at that time uh, we are really, really bullish, the market really, really bullish, and the risk taking is very, very stable, definitely we can allocate more and more and more Ethereum into it. And uh, so basically, the, the more stable uh, the risk taking system is, the more allocation we put into it. So basically, stakes on here got the flexibility. And for the future for risk staking, mm, from our attitude, we are bullish about it. Uh, but we also want to move uh, in a relatively, uh, relatively stable pace in terms of that. Are you going to allow for uh, like LST and at the same time LRT? Or is stone always like, going to be wrapped together with the LRT? Like once you do that. Uh, so for the method of risk taking and under stakes loan mechanism is all gonna to be exist in terms of strategies. As we can see currently ST theorem holding strategy, that means just holding ST theorem in the vault. And for risk taking, uh, we mentioned, uh, we also post a kind of like solutions a tech roadmap on our Twitter, if you're interested, you can refer to that. Is no matter if it is LST risk taking, Bitcoin chain risk taking, or LRT, it's gonna to be the same. It exists in stakes on vote um, in separate strategies. So it's not going to be a huge difference, but we really have to consider uh, additional factors like the safety, uh, <laughs> stability for each of the solutions adopted. Um, yeah, or basically what kind of assets would AVS support or who has the ability to put their Ethereum into the blue chip assets. So it's really, really complicated questions, but 
uh, definitely and gladly we got the flexibility. So um, we see risk-taking as a chance to boost Ethereum's risk free rewards and research chains ecosystem come to all benefits from it. Yeah. So <laughs> no no, okay. We we can we can talk about it later, sorry. Actually, I have one. Like, what's our criteria for chains that we choose to integrate with? Uh, in fact, we're planning a campaign, so related with our own incentives. And we, uh, so, at the very beginning, we are open to discussion. And we'll, if you are interested in terms of the liquidity as a module, as a service, <laughs> so feel free to reach out, and we can have an in-depth discussion. We're open to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you.